Hey everyone, welcome back to the Beyond Extend podcast. How is everyone doing? And thanks for jumping in again and listening. Um, we're here again with, as always, the beautiful William on the other side. Oh, so nice. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing good. Um, it's the weekend. It's nice. It's snowing again, actually. Oh yeah. Well, well, it's not snowing, but it it it, it snowed yesterday. Um, and everything is nice and white and fluffy. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the perfect time to talk about like how to prepare for a new scene, right? Yeah, getting all that inspiration. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's that's a thing we're gonna talk about today, right? Um, we wanna we wanna give like a little bit more information on how to plan your scene and how to do like the pre-production part and how to how to find the right scope for your scene as well. So we're gonna be diving into that. Um, so, I mean, we can just fire it off straight away, right? Like how, if you, if you want to give us like an overview, like how do you plan your projects ideally? Ideally. Hmm. Oh, wait, I mean, wait, actually this should come with a caveat, right? Um, I was thinking about this before the podcast and sorry to interrupt, man, but, um, we are in a different position than students, right? So I yeah. think this is like a really important distinction to make that the way that we do stuff now is because we have the luxury of time. So yeah. I kind of, what I was kind of thinking with this is that we're going to give like an overview of how we do stuff, but then also give like an overview on um, how ideally in like a position where time is a factor, we would kind of plan and, and do all that stuff. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead, man. Like, how, how do you normally go about, like, planning planning your project? Okay, so you've asked me two different questions. How, do I, how would I do it ideally and how do I do it? <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is different uh, in my case. Um, I'll start by saying um, how, how I do do it. So, usually, for me, a scene starts from some kind of, you know, some kind of spark of an idea. I guess that's the same for everyone. And then... Um, I usually actually start by doing some kind of either like a technical kind of test thing or some kind of um, other, yeah, like I usually start by trying something out. So um, the first thing I'll do is do like a little bit of a, not a vertical slice, but more of just a little prototype. So when I was doing my stylized Tokyo scene, it started with, I was thinking about how to make um, a cool workflow for stylized textures. And then I ended up doing just like a tileable for a roof. And um, I did that using all these like, kind of things that I had thought up in my head. And I, I made this texture and it looked really nice. And then I put it into Unreal and, and made a shader for it. And so, you know, okay, I can do this with it. Uh, this leaves me like a lot of options for the future. So I think I can then start doing an actual scene, right? So I guess usually that, that step a lot of people don't do because it's not really necessary. It's just for me personally, I always do this just because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's just to prove myself that I, that I'll be able to do it and I can already check a lot of boxes and, um, kind of get a lot of answers to how am I going to do specific things. So that's always my approach is that I want to answer a lot of these most pressing questions right away. Um, but yeah, and then I would start how you would usually approach a scene, which is, you know, look at reference, a lot of reference, then start doing some kind of block out, um, setting up uh, all of your systems, like I, we talked about this last uh, last podcast as well. So setting up your, your master materials, setting up all your little tools that you're going to need, um, and then starting to, you know, slowly replace all your blockouts and all your placeholder textures or whatever you might have with the real deal and then tweaking and lighting and all that stuff. That's how I would usually approach it, I guess. I mean, it's, I tried to condense it a little bit, but I think, uh, yeah, that's like the general gist of how I go about, uh, approaching a scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's cool, man. Um, so you basically start out with like a, a little bit of a benchmark or like a, yeah, the thing that we want, that you want to achieve first, and I think um, what what you said there 
is like tackling the big the big question marks first right and i think that's that's really important just in general like um mm. like if you're working on something and you want to challenge yourself make sure that that you tackle that that big item first before you start uh getting carried away with like set dressing or whatever you want to do in your scene yeah um yeah man like um it's it's sort of the same way for me the the way that i do it now i also start with um a thing that i want to learn or like a weakness that mm. i want to improve that sort of thing and then i i sort of i sort of build like a comfort zone around that mm -hmm. um so i start with um uh, for example this time around with like my medieval scene it's i never really figured out like a good shader that i could reuse across like all uh all my projects mm -hmm. and like standardizing the way that i work a little bit so that's the biggest the biggest um hurdle that i'm trying to overcome right now and then uh, building sort of like a comfort zone where i have like bits of foliage i have like a modular set like those are all things that i'm that i'm familiar with i know that i don't have to worry about those because i've done those like a couple of times Mm -hmm. and then that just gives me like a a kind of a safe space to just focus on like getting the shader like doing multiple iterations of the shader like doing a lot of tests like trying to really push the way it looks visually and then mm -hmm. i know that once i get to that point where i'm like okay i have this shader now i can just um spread that out over the scene where i need to and i can create like the entire thing um yeah but yeah like get I, your bases covered from the get-go and yeah. then it's just all going to become easier yeah exactly thing, yeah. yeah it's all it's sort of the same workflow right like if you look at it like in general like we start with like the big question first and then you go back to like what you're comfortable with like with your scene like you know how to model you know how to high to low poly bake you know how to create props you know all that stuff mm -hmm. so you you figured out like the, the most difficult thing first and then you went back into yeah. you go back to the routine stuff and then you just work on it and get it like yeah just pretty much you have a big list or whatever you have you have all your block out meshes in the end and then you just go about each of them and just replace them and yeah finalize mm -hmm. them i guess yeah exactly like how how does this workflow differ from when you were a student or when you were looking for a job it's a good question. I mean, thinking about it now, I've got a little bit of a, a story, I guess, I can tell about one of my scenes that will also move into the next topic, which is scope. Um, I I started working on a basement scene. I, I've got it up on my art station as well. It's, uh, it's just like this American-type basement thing of like a family home. And I I think it started as kind of an exploration of material blending because back then you know that was yeah that was three years ago you know i didn't have a lot of ideas about just how how i would set up like a cool blending material or whatever um and it was just yeah it was like a wall that i had with some tiles on it and then there was like behind the tiles there was like the concrete stuff and like the the mort uh, what is it called mortar that like mm -hmm. you know that the that the tiles were stuck to and then behind that there was a brick wall and i had like these three layers and i would see how i could do like, like how, how i would do it with the material setup and then some blending in between and um yeah and then i i i, I start, just started like taking these walls with the material i made and blocking out my scene with them kind of um and then i so it was actually quite similar to what I would do now, right? I would I answered the big question and then I went went straight into the block out. I added all my uh, all the stuff that I uh, wanted in there. Um, but back then, it was just I mean, obviously I was a lot less focused because I didn't really know where I was going, maybe as much as I do now. Um, so I remember working on like before getting some materials in the in the scene and getting everything right i was just finishing like fully polishing props and stuff which helped me i guess get kind of a an idea of how detailed i wanted everything to be right you know do like like you said like a little benchmark um but it wouldn't be like the ideal way to 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 start going about the, uh, the things 
But um, the more important part with that scene was actually the scope, right? Which is something that we're going to talk about in a second. Which was, it changed like four different times over the whole, yeah, over the whole time that I was working on the scene. It started out being a basement that had like, it had a hole in the wall where people had dug a tunnel to, I think it was probably like to rob a bank or something. <laughs> so it was like this family <laughs> home basement with a huge hole in the wall with a tunnel behind it. There was shovels and pickaxes everywhere. There was like barrels full of dirt. There was a, a table with a map on it with a big X over the bank. And there was like lines of cocaine and, uh, and uh, razor blades on the table. And there was like an old AK-47 I had made and I put it in there as well. And it was like, you know, I was trying to go super hard on the environmental storytelling um, with no subtlety at all, right? It was like, punch you in the face, something's going on here kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. And um, then I got my job. I moved to Spain. I had to take a break working on the scene. And um, I kind of realized, hey, I don't want to finish this the way that I've set it up right now. There's just too much going on with the scope. And I decided to cut it down to pretty much just having like a little corner of a room and adding all my props. But then I got some feedback that really resonated with me, which was, it just looks like a showroom to show off all the props, right? It doesn't seem like this is a space that people would live in. It's just, it, it feels like a little diorama with a couple of walls you put up just to show off all the props you made. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that 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 was very true. That was very real. It, it did look like that. So, what I uh, what I then did is kind of a mix between what I had before and after, and I decided to do. I think it was two big hero props, which was a uh, like a ping pong table and um, some stairs that would lead up to you know the above part of the house. Um, and yeah, that led to what I now have as my final scene, which is, it's not just two walls, like one corner, it's got, it's got three walls. The only thing I didn't make was the, the, the back wall that's behind you when you look through the camera. Um, and even though, you know, it's, it's three years ago, it's not the greatest scene I ever made or anything, but it's definitely a lot better than I think both of those things would have been. And it was, and I was able to finish it right so that that's a big thing with scope you you have to decide like yeah you can go really big but then you're probably not going to finish it so it's probably better to to cut down the scope a little bit and focus and also it was actually a lot more interesting i would say because i was able to put some environmental storytelling in this that was a little a little more subtle right and it's more about who lives in this house how long have they lived there you know where is it instead of punching me in the face with, oh, there's there's bad people here and they're using this basement to to dig a tunnel, which is, I mean, of course, there yeah, there can be some subtlety in there, but the way I did it, it was just very in your face. This is what's going on. It was yeah, like, yeah. how else are you going to tell that story other than, you know, put a big hole in the wall and a, and a map <laughs> with the bank and it says, rob here, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not going it, to, it's not very, very interesting. And, seeing this basement and thinking about, yeah, like, oh, there's like a basketball up there, like uh, some old license plates on the wall, you know, oh, they probably live around this area. It's, 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 it's kind of more interesting to, to, to explore, I feel like. Yeah, it's like building a backstory instead of like the immediate story that's happening. Exactly. And yeah, I think, I think as environment artists, like, um, that's something, that's something that we're, we're struggling with right like we we always tend to grasp towards like the immediate stories but actually the backstories are like what makes most scenes like more interesting than they than they are yeah um but anyway like um you mentioned like the the ping pong table and the stairs as like focal points um that's also something that that sometimes i keep in in my head as like as i'm developing like uh, an environment i think about what's the focal point going to be right mm -hmm. so what is the thing that i want to be what i want people to be focused on like with the with last bastion the factory that i did i i specifically made this like large silo that had like a flag on it with 
um, with like Last Bastion on it to indicate that this was like a survivor base. And I did that consciously and sort of the scope of the scene uh, was almost built around that. Like I yeah. knew that I wanted to have something big in the background. And then I I sometimes even use my my modular pieces to like put up put up fake walls or like restrict the vision of what you can see from the actual environment to save myself work mm-hmm. and and restrict the amount of time that I'm gonna be spending on like a project, right? So Yeah. I you can think kind that's, of uh, limit what what you know will be seen, and you can really focus on what's important. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's also what is what is really important as you're developing a scene. Um, I tend to, apart from like the focal point that I always have in my head, right? And as you said, like it's, I don't start that scene out with having that focal point in mind because it's like an organic process, right? Like I'm, I'm testing, I'm testing like new, new parts of the scene or I'm building, like you just mentioned as well, um, just some little benchmarks with like some new assets that I want to try out. And then I had this silo in my head and I had like staircases leading up to it. It's like, oh, what if I, what if I really emphasize like one of them and then make that like the focal point of the scene and then like build a supporting structure around it. And that's that sort of came in like I don't know like four iterations of the scene. Like it wasn't it wasn't like the first thing I did. No. Uh, it was it was more this organic exploration of of uh, your environment because that's also like a like a thing, right? Usually when when we talk about like planning your environment and talk about um, the production of your environment. Usually people see it as like a straight line and it gets portrayed as a straight line, but oftentimes it isn't. Like in all of the scenes that I've done, I've probably scrapped the entire scene um, multiple times because I was just like, huh, something doesn't feel right. Like there's something, there's something wrong here and I needed to just yeah. uh, sort of like cleanse the palette. And like start like a new level and then start building with the piece that I already had. Um, and then build like a, a whole new thing about it. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I think that's, that that can help a lot just to, yeah, get like a clean slate. And uh, yeah, you can, you can, I feel like sometimes you can get into, you can back yourself into a corner, right? When you're working on something, you start yeah. adding more stuff or you start adding the wrong stuff and then it just it can it can get you to a point where you're like well now i'm kind of committed to this but i don't even really like the idea or or i might always have this one issue with like one technical issue that i can't solve right now and then yeah sometimes it's best to take a step back and be like hey maybe i can like you said like reuse what i already have but put it in some kind of new context and get something else out of it without having to yeah, like commit to something that I'm not really, that I don't really want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's, I think that's that's also like part of being an artist, right? It's just like getting to know yourself in it too and like getting familiar with like how you work. And I mean, we talked about that a couple of times already. It's it's not only about the art that you produce, but it's also like the, the artist behind it, right? Where you get to know yourself, you get to know the scopes that you're comfortable with and like the, the, the sizes of the scenes that you are comfortable with producing uh, because it, it doesn't, you can always challenge yourself, right? But say you do, you're just starting out as a student, you build like a couple of dioramas and then you go from a diorama to like a fully open world scene. That's probably like a really big step doesn't mean you can't do it, but you're taking like a giant leap where... Yeah, and that's why then you have to answer some questions in before beforehand, right? You have to think about what is going to be the difference from going from a diorama to a, to a big, huge open world. And mm-hmm. what what is that going to mean for me and for my workflow, right? So maybe instead of working in a very unique way, like you're setting up everything uniquely for your diorama because it's only going to be a small diorama you have to think about modularity and how to reuse stuff and 
how to get the most out of everything, right? Yeah, man, that's such a good point because I think I think a lot of students and like beginners like trip over the fact where they see like a diorama, everything's unique, and they've built a yeah. diorama yourself, like you said, and then they wanna they wanna jump to like an open world and they think that everything in that open world is still unique. But no, like everything, well, almost I would say like ninety percent of it is just like reused um title balls blended with like um masks on top or like very very simple <clears throat> when it comes to the, the execution of those different assets right yeah yeah there is there's just a completely different approach yeah yeah exactly um so yeah like how because we're, we're talking about like our workflow right the entire time mm. like um how what would you recommend for like a student like if they if they say have like a limited amount of time let's say for for the sake of an example like you have two months to to finish like an environment mm -hmm. um how would you tackle that like how would you go about planning that so having this specific time frame means that you can work in a way that i don't know maybe some people are uh tired of hearing about it that are students because i i remember hearing that term a lot and it got on my nerves which is time box right you yeah. when you when you have a specific time frame that you're given or that you that you give yourself it means that you can plan in a way that you have to adjust other things so that you can fit it into this time frame so i think we used to have it with like this triangle of money quality and time right and it's like the sliders that i talked about <laughs> <laughs> I talked about last time that analogy that got kind of out of hand but um yeah so every time you take away from the time it means it's either gonna lose quality or it's gonna lose money <laughs> man you're but really good at analogies here <laughs> yeah i'm great i'm great at it but um no I, yeah so it's yeah exactly if you if you if you're gonna have if it's gonna take less time then you either have to sacrifice quality or you're gonna have to spend more money which means i guess more people or something i don't know yeah whatever exactly. it is it's it's basically right? saying that you can't achieve good quality in in like a super quick succession um without uh without the money like that's not possible yeah and um and that's kind of how how you have to approach building a scene when when you're given a time frame right you have to think about okay two months what can i do i'm obviously not going to be able to make a huge open world space i'm going to probably have to make either a diorama that might have some more quality but it's only going to be a little bit like a smaller scope or you can go a little bit bigger, maybe maybe make a couple houses with some props, but then you're gonna have to change the workflow. You have to you think about modularity, think about like we said, like reusing stuff, and that way you can you can then plan out. You know, take a day to plan out things that you might want in your scene, and think about how long they might take. It's really hard. I mean estimates and bids are like still <laughs> really hard for me to say because every everything is really different you know sometimes you have a breakthrough and you can get something done really yeah, easily sure. or then you you're struggling with an issue for a while and it, it can become like way longer than you thought yeah i think this is important to iterate too right like we have to do that all the time in the industry right we we have to offer estimates to our leads and to like art directors mm -hmm. but i mean for us it gets it can still be tricky like it's not yeah. it's not like because there's so many dependencies on it too right like uh mm -hmm. it's it's still tricky 100 percent. it's um yeah i actually really find it so hard to say how long i'm going to take because i've had tasks where or, or even when when you're given an estimate right you're, you're given a, a task that already has already says how long you should need for it sometimes i was like there was a task said oh yeah this is going to take seven days i finished it in two and it was like it was approved it was good and then i had stuff that was like oh, okay you're probably just going to take three days but it took me five just because everyone has different 
things that they can do better or worse than other people, right? So yeah, yeah. maybe if there's something that's a hard surface asset and the person that's making the bid isn't that great at hard surface, then for me, it's going to be like, what, seven days? This is just easy peasy, right? But then if it's something about maybe like organic sculpting, which I can do, but I'm not amazing at, like that's not my strong suit, I would say, then that'll mean that, yeah, it, it might take a little bit longer for, for, for some people. And then, so it's, it's really hard, but you, you could definitely like, if you, if you have some, some kind of good self-reflection, right. And you're able to look at what you want for your scene. If we're still talking about that scene, then that you have two months to build mm -hmm. and then you can kind of gauge from that. Okay. Also what, in what direction do I want to go? Right. Like, is this for showing off what I can do? then I should focus on what I can do and just pump out the most of it, right? Uh, I should completely just, if I'm, like I said, I'm a hard surface guy, so I'm going to make, I don't know, a mech workshop with a lot of cool mech parts all over the place and a nice focal point with a mech in the middle and then there's stuff and then it's already over scope, but, you know. <laughs> um, and, or is it something where I'm, I'm focusing on learning stuff, right? Do yeah. I want to make an outside scene with a couple trees and some rocks and maybe, uh, you know, like a, I don't know, a mech as a focal point. That would be cool. Um, <laughs> but, um, and that, and that, that, that will also influence how you can, how you can gauge the scope of your scene. Because if you know, okay, this is something that might take a little bit longer for me, then you already know to maybe keep the, keep the size of the project and the scope a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot of factors, but how, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've talked about a lot about the general things, but maybe for like, you know, you, you could give us like a, a look at how you would approach it uh, specifically. Yeah, but I, I think you brought some good points though, um, especially where you think about like the end result that you want to achieve, right? And how, mm -hmm. how it's going to be perceived by other people on your portfolio, which I think is such an important thing to... To reiterate because yeah. that's also something that i do with with the stuff with the stuff that i'm creating even now like i know that it's probably going to be on my portfolio one day so what do i want to show off with that piece um and in your case um like as as this fictitious student right that's that has like these these two months to work on it say you you have like organic environments but then you really want to move into like uh, like a hard surface role or you've recently discovered hard surface as a student and you're like so in love with it that you really want to build something with that. That's, that's also something really important that you need to keep in mind and just move towards that. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, slowly pivot, pivot yourself towards it because this might be the first project and then you're probably going to expand on the hard surface aspect with like the, the scenes that are going to come after that. So, yeah, I think that's, that's so important. Like, think about how it's going to be displayed on your portfolio and what, what like, it's going to offer you as, like, a sort of a badge, right? Like, it's sort of this badge of, like, look, I can do hard surface. Mm -hmm. Like, it, that's displayed on your portfolio then. Yeah, you can um, even think about it as slide. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> fucking sliders again? <laughs> Every time. Um, but to go back to your, um, time boxes though, um, yeah, I think, I think that's also like a, a good, uh, the, the way that I would do it is it's, it's sort of the same way, right? Like you're thinking about like these time boxes that you're like, okay, week one, I'm going to do this week two, I'm going to do this, blah, blah. Um, a good, a good tool to help with that is start at the end. Like, what is your end result going to be? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you envision it? And then plan your way backwards. Because it's really hard to, say, plan at the start. And then you're quickly going to see that you, that you have to do adjustments to, like, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, like, start with, with the end. So, like, the final week is, in most cases, like, presentation, um, art station, polishing. preparation, polishing, like all, all that kind of stuff, right? Like it's, it's the last 5% of that, that environment. And then you can kind of work your way backwards where 
um, again, like reiterating a point that we brought up earlier, focus on the hero prop first or like the biggest the biggest questions first, get those out of the way as quick as possible. So take, I would say, well, it depends on the on the environment, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But say say we're going with your example, like the mechanical workshop. There's probably going to be like a, a bigger mech in that mechanical workshop. So that would be like the, the focal point, which makes it like the hero prop and also makes it like the benchmark that you need to achieve first. No. Um, and that also, that probably also opens up like some other opportunities where you can, where you have like all the parts from the mech already modeled anyway. So you could probably strip it down and scatter it in the scene to have it sort of set up as like this, this workshop and there's like spare parts around, even though yeah. they're kind of reused from the bot, right? But they might be textured differently or they might be combined in different ways. Um, instead of approaching it, again from like this this purely unique thing that everything needs to be unique you can yeah. already see that by tackling that big object first that there's it opens up like other opportunities for the rest of the scene yeah and um it also gives you an like an emergency hatch so that let's say you have two months but then you get sick you can't work for three weeks let's say right worst case scenario yeah and then you end up having like you're in your fifth week or whatever and you've got your mech half done and then you can still pivot and say okay i'm not going to be able to finish this whole workshop i'm not going to be able to make the environment make the the all that all that stuff right all the other detail that i would need to finish the scene but what i can do is just finish this mech and then at least i'll have a mech that i can show right so it 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 gives you some amount of security that when you start with these important bits that then it leaves you open for to later on change your scope in case you either over scoped or there's something unforeseen happening like uh you losing time on your project mm -hmm. yeah exactly because i'm a good plan it needs to be agile like you need to be able to to like switch it up like move in between you need to be making adjustments on the fly so even though we talked about the time boxes right like is planning your project from like the the end to the beginning have it don't have it super granular have it in a yeah. way where you can still make adjustments on the fly so that's why i mentioned strokes exactly that's that's why we both mentioned right like the the final week is just going to be polish and presentation because polish and presentation are are just like this this big big categories like how you define it that's you can't really plan for that just yet you just have to throw it into these big categories and um yeah i mean it's uh that's actually it's it, it's funny because it kind of describes the way that i approached my new scene which is something that i'm probably not going to work on for a while now because i'm back on my tokyo scene because i decided you know i don't want to leave that by the wayside and then have it not finished because i really love that scene and i want to finish it but i yeah. started um working on a scene where there was like a you know a truck in, in some snow and it was going to look great and super realistic all that stuff um and the way i did it was i started first with a snow shader and a snow material in, in in unreal that allowed me to like paint in um tessellated tracks in the snow from a car and um because that was something that i'd never really done before in that way i, I never made snow i'm not r really like um hugely familiar with a lot of that kind of like the the more organic side of um of like environments with terrain all that stuff mm -hmm. uh that's not something that i was really focused on in the in the past so i started with that kind of got the biggest questions out of the way like we said it allowed me to then be a lot more confident about okay i know i i got beautiful snow now so all the rest isn't going to be that big of a deal and then my focal point in this scene uh was going to be a truck uh like an old f-150 ford kind of kind of truck um so that's what I started on next because I knew I also never made a full realistic car before. I've made cars before, but they were always, you know, like either stylized or they weren't like the big focal point in the scene. 
Mm-hmm. So I decided, yeah, this is going to be the most important thing for me to get out of the way. Because even if then in a couple months or probably now in a year, because I just need to finish the Tokyo thing first. <laughs> but whenever I go back to it, um, I'll be able to say, hey, you know what? The snow's nice, but I don't have time to make rocks and snow covered trees and, and grass peeping out of the thing, out of the snow. But I can still finish this truck and I'm going to have a nice truck that I can put on my portfolio, you know? Yep. It's so that's exactly like you said. It's um it's starting with this big thing, getting it out of the way, because first of all, it gives you like you you will already have completed the most important part of your scene. And if then you decide you won't pursue the scene or you don't have time to do it, then you still have something to show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's always easier to add stuff to a scene than to take away. Because 100%. what what happens when you take away stuff? Like say say we go to your basement scene, for example, right? Mm-hmm. We have this entire basement. Um, we take your example again, uh, where you fell you fell sick. You're not gonna make a deadline, and you have to scrap the half of the basement. You're you're gonna be you're gonna be either trying to force the assets that you already created for the the area that you scrapped into the stuff that you into the into the part of the scene that you want to keep right Mm -hmm. because you don't want to lose that work so you're just going to be cramming that stuff in there um which is which is not going to look good because then it's it's like you said before it's going to turn into like the showroom for like all the assets that you created Mm -hmm. so yeah definitely keep that in mind like start with the big thing and then like branch outwards because um, I think I think I made like a, a weekly tip about this too, where you kind of have to see it as a game, right? You're building yourself save points, like the the mech example. Like once the mech is done, that's a save point. Like you can show that mm-hmm. off on your portfolio, um, even if you don't have like a scene around it. It's still it's still gonna look good if you finished it properly. And then if you still want to work on the scene, um, because this brings up like another important part, right? You might be mentally done with that scene as well you might be just like oh god i don't want to work on this scene anymore because yeah because maybe you wanted to explore hard surfaces in this case but during that whole process you just figure out that i don't really i don't really like hard surface i just want to go back to organic then you still have something that you can put on your portfolio in between like all the organic stuff to show off that you if if like a company were to hire you, you can still do the hard surface stuff if you wanted to. Yeah. And then you can say, okay, I like, I like doing the mech. It was okay. But yeah, like you said, I'm over it. I want to do organic stuff. And then having the, having the mech done would mean that, you know, you can maybe pivot your scene and put the mech in a forest. Right. And then, you might have to scrap the the block out you did for your beautiful mechanic workshop but the only thing you're scrapping is a block out that maybe took you a day or two instead yep. of scrapping all the little wrenches and you know fucking tools that are scattered around the workshop which then you're not going to be able to use in in your forest most likely Um, but then instead you have a beautiful mech that you can then put in the forest over a cool broken tree stump and it's going to look awesome and all that stuff. Um, Man, I feel so called out by all this, all this chat about like a mechanic (laughs) workshop because (laughs) I, I did a fucking scene like that. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. I I had like a a mech workshop. No. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I scrapped it because... It's like exactly like you said. I was working on wrenches and I was working on like oil cans and they were looking like really nice. But I didn't tackle the big thing. Like the mech was still like a block out. And yeah. then after a while, I was just like populating the scene with like these tiny wrenches. And I was like, oh, this is looking cool. And I'm just putting like a nicely textured wrench on like a gray block out. And it's like, yeah, this doesn't feel uh, right. <laughs> wow. I can't. What? That's crazy. <laughs> That's so that's so crazy. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, there you can see it, right? I'm not I'm not just talking bullshit. I mean, maybe half the time, but 
sometimes I actually kind of know what I'm talking about. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's just like subtly dissing me on the podcast. But that's, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. I had no idea. I actually had no idea. That's crazy. But yeah, um, that's, yeah. I mean, there's, it's, it's it, this kind of thing. I mean, it always, you know, hindsight's always 2020 or 2021 in this case. <laughs> um, oh, God. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, of course, this, this kind of experience now helps us, uh, with 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 all this stuff it, it means that the next time we'll have a little bit more of a clearer picture of uh, how we want to approach things but that's why we were that's why we're telling you this right hopefully when you approach your next scene you can have these kind of tips in mind because it might save you time it might save you a lot of nerve and maybe yeah get you to where you want to go quicker mm -hmm. yeah exactly um because it's it's like there's this old saying like um I don't know if it's an old saying, but like we we've run into like the brick wall so that you don't have to, right? Like we made all the mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, classic and saying. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, because yeah, I was never too good at um, learning from other people. I was never that open about my stuff when I was like a student, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that makes it interesting going back to back to your basement that you were talking to people that mentioned like, oh, this looks like a diorama for or like props. And then based on that, you decided to like expand it a little bit, like focus a little bit more on like the the environmental storytelling and like the backstory of it mm -hmm. where. um yeah, I mean, we did we did like an entire podcast about like feedback and like where to get feedback, right? Um, so you can yeah. listen you can listen to that one, but that's obviously like a big part of it because I didn't do that and I just ran into that brick wall, mm -hmm. and I well, <laughs> that that usually ended with like me scrapping the project because I was so focused on like the wrong thing. Yeah, and that I mean that was um, I mean it just underlines the importance of feedback. Uh, that's exactly right. Because that was um, just at the end of my uni. I mean, not not the actual end of my uni, but before I left my uni, and uh, it was during a, a mentorship by uh, uh, Jeremy Estrealo by Dynasty, right? Mm. So he was the one that told me, "Hey, this is this looks like a prop showcase, right?" Um, obviously, you know, that's why I listened to him because I knew that he was he knew what he was talking about, right? Maybe if a peer at my uni had told me it maybe i wouldn't have listened and uh you know who knows what might have happened but um yeah it's um that was that was the exact same thing right because he had already made these uh made these experiences he knew what to tell me and that's why his his feedback was so valuable to me mm -hmm. yeah exactly um, um let's let's switch it up though let's um if we if we go back to the, the beginning, right? Like um to like you get carte blanche for like your next project. Um a thing a thing that I often often start with as well, like once once I'm like exploring what the next the next uh project is gonna be, right? Is um and I'm a really big advocate for this, is just think about a story. Think about you what you want to tell with that environment. Yeah. Because um that story that you're thinking of it doesn't have to be like a, an entire backstory right it doesn't have to be multiple pages it, it can be like a couple of lines that it can really help you um figure out like a couple of props or like figure out um even what the scope of it is going to be like say say you you think about like a nice story about like an american a suburban basement right um mm. and it's it's like a, a traditional family home and they have they have like these these really interesting um backstories with like the license plates and and the basketball like it's it can be subtle stuff like that but it's really gonna it's really gonna add to your environment yeah it, it means that again you know what to focus on right yeah because that told me like okay that ping pong table you know it's such a big signifier of it, it can it can tell you a lot about that family it's just a ping pong table but it, it means you know there that's maybe where the two the two brothers play you know that's where they grew up together they they bonded in this in this dusty old basement or maybe it means that you know the 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 father of the family 
used to be a professional ping pong player, but now he doesn't have the time and his ping pong table is getting dusty in the basement. You know, like whatever it might be, but it, it can it can mean a lot of things. And then you can use your other props to focus down on one of this in, 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 onto one of these stories, right? And um, like you said, it gives you a plan from the get go to what to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Did you did you use any? tools for like planning planning assets or like keeping track of all of the stuff um i think for that project because we used that at at our uni i used trello okay um which is pretty much you know i mean for people that know, don't know it's like an online type uh not a task kind of a task tracker it's uh yeah is it a task tracker is that what it's called yeah, task tracker. Like I would, I would also call it like a whiteboard or something. Like you can just yeah. put stuff on there, and like other people in your team can see it. Yeah, and I just made one for myself where I had like a table, and it and it said like what was it like backlog, uh, work in progress, and done. Right, and yep. then you just know how many things you got left. You you made your block out for your washing machine, so you then create your Trello task, finish washing machine, and then you put it in. In, uh, done when you're done and then you know how, how much stuff you've you've got left and then you can if you've made your washing machine you might know how long the dryer is going to take so then that means you'll be able to plan out your time better right you, you you already know okay i've got this many tasks left so far i've got like an average of two days per task so uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, i know that it's gonna take me three weeks to finish but i only got two weeks left so what do i need to cut right yeah um so yeah, that that can yeah. that can definitely help a lot. But what I use now is uh, just my brain, and <laughs> uh, and the the sticky notes on the desktop, the Windows sticky notes. Yeah, it's, like honestly, yeah. it's it's sort of the same transformation for me, right? Like um, <laughs> I I use like Trello a couple of times, but I don't know. Like I always felt it cumbersome going to a site, like doing those additional clicks. And then, yeah. obviously, you kind of need to have something like that if you're doing it with a team, right? Yeah, you need to... and that's the thing. You already do enough of that at work, you know? Yeah, I exactly. I already do. I already sign JIRAs and write comments and stuff at work. I don't want to do that at home as well. Exactly. So, the the stuff that I have on, on my desktop, I don't even use, like, the notepad for, for Windows. I just use, like, sticky notes on my actual desktop. I mean it's it's such a traditional technique but it's still the thing that works the best for me like looking at it right now i have a couple of really big sticky notes right um i have one for like if we're talking about like beyond extent too right not only personal work um i have like one list for the website one list for the community one list for the streaming um then i have like a future to do which is just like some random stuff that i can write on there um but i love it man like as soon as i think about something i'll just write it on like a post-it note and just slap mm -hmm. it on my on my desk and because i mean sometimes i pff, i forget stuff man like the the brain doesn't cut it anymore <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i that's that's the exact point right you you need those I don't need to write everything out in specific tasks anymore. At least I don't feel like I do. Yep. But having just general things that I know I might forget, having those as sticky notes, like I'm not going to forget to make my third house, right? Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I don't, I'm not going to forget what I need to do for that because I also have that experience of what it, what, what it takes, what it's broken down into. But I might forget that I still have to add some cables to my uh, satellite dishes or that I still have to fix that one shader that uh, doesn't have the right uh, blending mode, right? And so mm -hmm. I'll, 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 I'll just jot that down. And then I also have a sticky note that says I need to get an appointment to get my wisdom teeth out. Damn it. I still have to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, just stuff like that, right? And I think probably using something like Trello especially at the start, is still a good idea. I think that's why we also did it, right? Because we knew it would kind of help us. Yep. Because, I, yeah, right now, I, I just need a sticky note that says all the little things that I might forget. But before, making house number three might not be just that big thing in your mind. Like, because you don't know... What, like what what does that mean it means okay i need to make a texture i need to make the actual mesh i need to do uh the windows i need to do the thing i need to do a trim sheet for this and 
at the start, it's great to break it down, put it in a Trello sheet and say, okay, this is one thing, this is one thing, this is one thing. And then all these parts together do uh, like they combine to make house number three. Yeah. Um, which right now I don't, yeah, I don't need those reminders anymore. I know how to make a house, but at the start, I think great like crutch to to get you where you want to, where you need to go because it, it means yeah. that you'll always have your your eyes on the prize. You know what to do. You know what steps you need to take. Yeah, and I also think in in addition to that, it's um, it's been proven that if you keep keep track of your stuff and you you tick like a checkbox you get a little bit of like a what's it called like an endorphin hit where it's it makes you happy because you finished like a task um and this sounds so silly right i know i know you might be and like a student currently thinking like oh my god that's that's so stupid why why would that ever happen but it works like trust me sometimes oh yeah sometimes your your projects can depend on those little hits of just like happiness and being like oh i did good today it just mm -hmm. because you like say house number three you have all these different checkboxes of like uh texture creation block out blah blah blah. you have it broken up into pieces you check all those tech and check boxes and then house three is done and you can see that visually and it's like oh shit that feels good like i'm yeah. done with that task i don't have to worry about it anymore but yeah man um that's the thing right like if we look at our student student times and where we were like more um more restricted by deadlines or maybe mm -hmm. even even if we look at our professional work i i still use the sort of same techniques if i don't have uh, a jira assigned to me right like mm -hmm. it's still jira is still kind of the same as trello it's just like more advanced and there's more stuff in it yeah um but you're still you're still doing the same thing and Jira is used by a lot of companies. So mm -hmm. I mean that that adds some validity to it too, right? It's also it's also a, a tool to keep track of everything too, right? But I mean there is something to seeing that ticker go up and being like, oh, I resolved like a couple of bugs today. And it's like, oh yes, oh, feel good. Best. <laughs> yeah. Putting a putting a Jira like to review or to done is the greatest feeling. Yep. It's because it, yeah, it, it gives you, like you said, it gives you an endorphin rush, but it also, it just, it means, yeah, okay, I'm done with this. I can move on to the next thing. It just gives me the sense of peace. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, it just, gives you it's like one a, less thing to worry about. Exactly. It gives you like peace of mind because then you can, you can look at something tangible. Like you can look at your Jira dashboard or like your Trello dashboard and look at all the stuff you've already done. And it just reminds you that that you're doing stuff, like you're making progress throughout the thing. Yeah, and and that's exactly the thing that you said, right? With the uh, when you were talking about breaking, like you were talking about my my thing with breaking down the house three and how it gives you these in endorphin hits. If you don't have that Trello board, especially starting out, you might even not know where you stand, right? You're like, okay, I might I made this and this, but house three isn't done. I still didn't check that of my box, so. You know, what have I been doing for these last couple of days? And then yep. it it means that you also can't, it also like, it, it helps you plan out how long the house is going to take because you know, okay, I've got these three tasks done and I there's four more tasks. So, you know, maybe it's going to take a little bit longer, but at least I kind of know how long it's going to take until I'm done. And um, yeah, in addition, you get this, this that extra gratification from, from mm -hmm. checking all the, the boxes off. Yeah, it's like it's like you said. It it helps you stay focused on like the bigger tasks too. Because say mm -hmm. say you add like an importance to it, right? So house three yeah. is like really important, but you keep finishing other tasks. Like it's a it's a reminder that you're you might be distracted or mm -hmm. that you're not focusing on like the correct things to get your scene done. Yeah. And again, like this is gonna take some time to set up. Like again, like we, we said with the estimates as well, right? Um, you might be doing some initial estimates, you might add them to like the individual tasks. So like house three is gonna take me like one week. I could do that mm -hmm. easily. But then you forget about that one shader that you need to set up and you're doing some glass and you don't know how glass works, and then it it goes from like one week to like two weeks. 
Mm-hmm. So it's better to add like a little bit of a buffer when you're doing planning like this, where yeah. say comfortably, like this is going to take me like one week, realistically, even then add like a 25% or like a 30% additional time onto that, yeah. that you have a little bit of a buffer because at the end of a project, the time that you have saved on that buffer, if, if there's any time at all, right? Um, it can be used on like polishing, like upping the presentation and then you're less stressed about hitting that deadline too. Yeah. And another thing that I just thought of is that it helps you with um, planning the next project after it. Because if you have your house three broken down into all these tasks, you can see what were the tasks that I was like in front of the ahead of the timeline, right? What was mm-hmm. the stuff that took longest for me? And then it means that next time you plan house number four um, or a completely new scene, you know, like you have a better idea of what it is going to take you and you already know the risk points, right? You can see, oh, the glass shader has, it's it was five days over um, over the estimate. So I guess it's really something that I should kind of get out of the way and focus on and or just know that it'll take me a little bit longer maybe, or maybe it's not going to take you longer because you learned from what you did in your last project. But it just, it makes you, I think, a, like it, it helps you with the ability to just understand how you personally work and yeah. how this will affect the work in your future and how you can kind of use that to 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 focus on, on the things you, you need to focus on. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like that's a really good point to bring up too. Like it just makes you more conscious about like the time that you're yeah. putting in and like investing in it. Yeah. yeah Instead man. of yeah, having one big Jira task or one big Trello task is not going to really help you with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You won't remember exactly. it in 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 a in a year when you're working on your next project. But if you still got your Trello board, you can you can uh, go through all the tasks and kind of uh, get a feel for how long your next things might take. And, mm-hmm. uh, how hard it's going to be yeah yeah so like all of the stuff that we're we're currently discussing like it it has like one goal right the goal is always to like finish a project that's why we're talking about like planning and like scoping correctly and and all that stuff it's it's all to um to keep you on track and like keep you keep you sort of satisfied when you're working on that project too, right? And finish it at mm. the end and have like a, a good portfolio piece out of it. Um, so I kind of want to want to dive into some stuff that's, that's sort of, what is it? Like supportive to that. And mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the big things that I'm a big proponent for is being really public about the stuff that you're doing. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like this can take many shapes, right? Like either posting it on Twitter or talking to your game dev friends or like posting it on like a discord or whatever. Um, but this, this sort of public accountability is also really good at just making you more conscious about the time and, and like having, having that deadline in mind too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's something that I've. I don't know. I'm I'm not great at to be honest. Um because since I yeah, since I got into the industry, I've kind of been very I've, I've, I'm just doing my thing. I'm not really out for yeah, I'm not, I'm not posting my stuff on a thousand discords like I used to. Mm-hmm. Um I'm usually just talking to my friends about it, right? I'll I'll be like, "Hey man, this is what I've been doing just uh what do you think?" Yeah, so, exactly, right. It doesn't it doesn't always have to be like social media, but like yeah. we 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 talk about like our projects. So, yeah. that's like a, a different a different way, right? And I think that transition happens anyway once you get into the industry because then you're surrounded by professionals mm. that that kind of have like the same goals and admirations and you can get like direct feedback from them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh that's something that it, it definitely helped me at the start, like you said, get a get a feel for just first of all, you know how how far am I progressing? Because having these kind of snapshots that you take and and send to to out to the world, it gives you like a feeling of okay, 
this is the actual, this is how much my, my final thing changed, right? This is how much closer I've come this week to, to finishing my goal. And, um, it can help you not only with understanding how, how you work, but it also means that it, it can help you kind of, uh, yeah, learn what, to, like what, what to get out of the way again, what to focus on, what maybe to, what idea to maybe scrap because you realize, oh, building this has taken so much time, but actually it's not really helping the overall look of this. So maybe you can, you can get rid of some small props that you have in your Trello and you decide, you know, instead of making all these small little props that you can barely see because it's so small on the screen, I'm going to focus and put this time into lighting or post processing processing. Cause I know that's going to have a, a bigger impact on the actual final image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's, again, like I keep repeating this, right? It's something that it's going to take time to just get accustomed to. You're going to, you're going to feel how it works. You're going to, you're going to be iterating and like adjusting the process for yourself. Yeah, man, I think there's, there's so many factors to this, right? Um, it's such it's such a big topic to to be talking about and there's so many so many aspects of like finding the right scope and like finding what works for you um but i but i really do hope that you, this sort of this sort of talk helps everyone out there just getting getting like a right scope of it and like helping you in like the next project too um so what do you think man should we give like a a quick overview of like the suggestions from from our side like if there were like, uh, I don't know, like a couple of suggestions that were like, look, just do this and then, uh, you should be, you should be in fairly good shape. Yeah, let's do it. So, um, yeah, the first one is definitely, um, picking, picking that initial focal point, right. Or building, building that initial benchmark and getting like the big question out of the way that's. I think we, we kept on going back to that. And I think that's like the, the most important part um, when starting starting the project. This is, I feel like we skipped a, skipped a step with like not, not talking about planning, but if you're actually doing the production of it, um, that is definitely the thing that you need to need to look out for first. Um, yeah, another thing is... Um trying to understand what you what you want to show with a specific scene not only in the the technical aspects of it but the actual like what you are actually showing so in terms of camera angles right and all that stuff like if i remember making a fully modular city and then only using a couple of screenshots from it so i built like half a city for nothing i yeah, i put yeah. so much uh, so many ideas and so many things into you know, these little details and then I never even use them because I, I, for some reason made a whole city as if I was making a game. Right. <laughs> so that, that's uh, that's that scene that I, I think I showed on that episode where we showed off our old portfolio pieces, that mm -hmm. modular fantasy thing. Yeah. It was like a whole town. And, um, that's something that I think is really important because it, it again, helps you find your focal point, helps you prioritizing helps you with prioritizing all your your things because you yeah if, if that thing is only going to be at the corner of the screen and or maybe it's not even going to be in any shots like why are you doing it like i don't know why did i do why did i model my blacksmith and then in the end i never took a screenshot of it right <laughs> yeah exactly it's so important to, to to keep that in mind um let's have a look here uh what else? Like we talked about so much stuff, right? Yeah. Um, this is this is more for when you're a student, right? And you're you're building up your por your portfolio. Um, we only talked a little bit about it, but use use deadlines and use time boxes within those deadlines as well. Like set yourself a goal for this next environment, like we, we kept on bringing up like the, the two month environment, right? The mechanical workshop, for example, hmm. um, do that for like your other scenes too, where you can just focus on like, okay, I want to build like 
I don't know, like I'm a, I'm a final year student, I have no other classes and I'm just spending time on my portfolio, right? Imagine that is the case. Yeah. You can, you can sort of look at the overall deadline of like, okay, I have six months to get a portfolio done. So I can either split that up into like three um, relatively smaller pieces or have like two somewhat bigger scenes. Um, so think about that and think about how you how you would divide your time and like really try to stick to those deadlines mm -hmm. yeah um what else uh, pick well, a focal point do a mm -hmm. thing yeah what is i'm trying to i'm trying to like compress it down into another bullet point i can give yeah. um i i got another one while you while you yeah. think of one um, this is something that, that we brought up in the beginning is pick, pick like a, a technical achievement or like a, a new challenge for yourself and mm -hmm. pad it with like your comfort zone so that your the, a large part of the scene is still something that you're comfortable with, but have that one thing or like that one aspect that you've never tried before. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, you finished the mechanical workshop. But now you want to do something more organic or you want to introduce like foliage. Maybe you can do something like um, have like an, like an old mechanical factory line, like show off a part of it, but it's like abandoned and has like some foliage growing into it. Yeah. So you're still sticking within like your comfort zone, which is hard surface and then expanding it to like foliage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the next, the next one for me would be something like be agile, um, keep that flexibility about yourself, right? Be able to adjust to things that happen that take longer, that are maybe done quicker than you thought. And yeah, like we said, if you, if you need to make a, if you need to scrap that scene, try to build towards a point where it's going to make like it's going to make it as easy as possible and then uh yeah you're going to have a uh, an easier time if if things go go awry mm -hmm. yeah man building those safe points i think uh i think that's a really yeah. good good that was one a great analogy i'm really i'm, I'm really jealous it's way better than <laughs> fucking slider bullshit <laughs> no i think you need to keep going man keep going with all the <laughs> all the analogies <laughs> don't encourage me all right uh, I think I think that's sort of it, right? I think we went to through like all the points that we wanted to talk about. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank everyone for listening and like all the support that everyone has offered us so far. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope this could help some people out there. Bye bye. See ya. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, then don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to share it with your friends. If you're an environment artist trying to break into the industry or just looking to grow your skills, you can find a ton more resources like weekly tips, blog posts and more on beyondextend.com. But that's going to do it from our side. Thanks so much for joining us and a shout out to all of our Patreon supporters who made this possible.